Hi guys! So today we are going to cover chapter 13, which talks about the brain and the cranial nerves. So first off, some brain basics. On average, it's about three pounds of tissue, and the brain is the center for everything. It makes us who we are. It is where sensations will register, we can make decisions, we can interpret those sensations, and take action, of course. It is where our behavior is at, our emotions, our intellect, of course, memory. So in a nutshell, our brain is the essence of who we are. Without the brain, we can't function. Without the brain, we are declared brain dead. We have a machine that can pump our heart for us. We have a machine that can breathe for us. But we don't have anything that can replace our brains. There's 100 billion neurons, which remember those are the cells of the nervous system and 10 trillion neuroglia, which remember are the cells that nourish and take care of the neurons. They say that a larger size brain means that you have a higher level of intelligence. And studies show that this is true to some extent, except the difference is minimal. So if you have a larger brain, you are only slightly more intelligent than the average person. During the first 26 days of development, the brain and spinal cord will develop from the ectodermal neural tube. Now this neural tube is really important because it will close and surround the spinal cord. However, if the neural tube does not close, as you can see in that ultrasound picture, that fetus has that bulge that the arrow is pointing to. That is where the neural tube did not close all the way. So that is basically the spinal cord and all of the tissue bulging out from that fetus's back. The neat thing is now that they can actually do surgery intrauterine. So there's a picture of a doctor who is doing intrauterine surgery on a 23-week-old fetus, and they show him actually shaking the baby's hand, which is kind of neat. On the other side, the superior end, if that doesn't close all the way, that is not conducive to life because what happens is the entire brain ends up being exposed, as you can see in those pictures. The major parts of the brain are the brainstem, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the cerebrum. The brainstem is a continuation of the spinal cord. This is where all of our survival stuff is at. So the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. The cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain, and this coordinates our subconscious movements, but also is the reason why we can sit up straight, because it contributes to posture and muscle tone. The diencephalon is the thalamus and the hypothalamus, and then the cerebrum is, evolutionarily speaking, the newest part of our brain, but it's the largest part of our brain as a whole. So this whole area is basically the cerebrum. It's in the cerebral cortex, and perception, thought, imagination, judgment, and decision-making occur here. This is just showing you a picture. So you can see the cerebrum is the bulk of the brain, as we would say. The cerebellum is at the back, and then the brainstem is that continuation of the spinal cord. And then basically on top of the brainstem is the diencephalon, which has the thalamus and the hypothalamus combined. So the cerebrum, the surface layer of it is referred to as the cerebral cortex. So the bulk of the brain is the cerebrum, but then that surface layer is the cerebral cortex. This is the gray matter. There are gyri, which are the folds that you can see in this picture. And then there are fissures, which are the grooves that you can see in this picture. Now there's also things called the sulci. Now, the difference between a fissure and a sulci is the depth. Sulci are more shallow and fissures are deeper. So the longitudinal fissure is what separates the right and the left hemisphere. So it's really deep. And then the sulci can kind of be found all over the place. But like I said, the difference is how deep down it goes. The inner mass is the cerebral white matter. This contains myelinated axons. Myelinated axons are going to connect the parts of the brain to other parts, basically. And there are different tracks that we can hopefully remember. Association tracks are tracks that conduct impulses between the gyri and the same hemisphere. 
So think about if you associate with people, you kind of associate with people that are around you at the time. So the impulses are conducted in the same hemisphere. Commissural tracks conduct impulses between gyri in one hemisphere to another. So try to remember if you commiserate with somebody, if you commiserate with people, you're commiserating with a larger group of people. So your association is kind of right near you, but when you commiserate, you're commiserating with a bunch of people. So it's a larger, on a larger magnitude. And then we have projection tracks. These conduct impulses to the lower parts of the central nervous system. So think about if you project onto somebody, you know, you're projecting it. Or maybe think about um, how a uh, movie projector projects a movie onto a screen. It's going to project it somewhere else. So the projection tracks take the impulses and project them to the lower parts of the central nervous system. At the longitudinal fissure, the white matter remains connected by a bundle of transverse white fibers called the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is the big tract, basically, that is going to connect the right and the left hemispheres. The cerebral hemisphere is then divided into four lobes. We have the frontal lobe, which is right in front. The occipital lobe is in back. The parietal lobe is on the sides and the top. And then the temporal lobes are on the sides right above your ears. The presential gyrus is anterior to the central sulcus. So as the name implies, pre is before. So before the central. And then the central sulcus goes across here. So the gyrus before the central, in a nutshell, is what it means. That's important because it has the primary motor area. The post-central gyrus, which is right behind the central sulcus, is also important because it has the primary somatosensory area. And those are going to be important later, so remember those. The parietal occipital sulcus, as the name implies, separates the parietal lobe from the posterior most occipital lobe. So the occipital lobe's in the back, the parietal lobes are on the top sides, so the parietal occipital sulcus separates them. And then the lateral cerebral sulcus, sometimes referred to as a fissure, separates the frontal lobe from the two temporal lobes on the sides. The lobes of the cerebrum correspond to the bones of the brain case that have the same names. So they should be pretty easy to remember if you already know the bones, which you should already know the bones. So you've got the frontal bone, which corresponds to the frontal lobe, the parietal bones, which correspond to the parietal lobes, temporal bones, temporal lobe, and occipital bones, occipital lobe. Now there are a few functional areas that are really important as well. Broadman's areas refer to the numbered regions of the cortex that have kind of been mapped to have specific functions. There are sensory areas which receive and interpret incoming sensory impulses, and there are motor areas which control executions of voluntary movements. Now the sensory areas in the parietal lobe, which are in the sides here, you have the areas for touch, proprioception, temperature, vision, auditory, taste, smell, etc. Occipital lobe, you have the areas for vision back here. And then the temporal lobes, which are right above the ears, have areas for hearing, of course, and smell and some other things, but those are the two big ones. The motor areas are mostly in the frontal lobe. Then you also have what are called association areas. As the name implies, they create associations between things. So they're going to interpret the meaning of some of the incoming sensory info. So things like memory, emotions, judgment, intelligence, those are gonna take place in the association areas. And these are usually located between sensory and motor areas. So here's a map showing you Broadman's numbered areas. Two I want you to really pay attention to are Broca's speech area, which are 44 and 45 on the map, and Wernicke's area, which is 39, 40, and 41 on the map. The reason that these are important is because these areas are often damaged when people have strokes. So Broca's area is kind of right about here. That is the area for forming speech. 
So Broca's speech area is why I can talk to you right now. It is why I can form words and put sentences together. On the other hand, Wernicke's area, which is a little further back, that is where speech is comprehended. So the reason that you can understand what I'm saying is because of Wernicke's area. Now, people who have strokes and these parts are often damaged get really frustrated because if Broca's area is damaged, they know what they want to say, but they can't form the words to say it. So that could be very frustrating. On the other hand, if Wernicke's area is what's damaged, they do not understand what people are saying to them. They can form words, they can speak, but it's nonsensical speech because they do not have the comprehension that they once had. So rehabilitation is important and trying to get those areas back up and running is important, but it's very difficult to do depending on the extent of the damage, of course. So this is why I was telling you to pay attention to that postcentral gyrus and precentral gyrus. The primary somatosensory area contains the sensory areas for pain, vision, auditory, smell, taste, everything. And the parietal lobe up here, it is touch, proprioception, pain, temperature, some visual and auditory, taste and smell. In the occipital lobe, there's the sensory areas for vision. And in the temporal lobe, on the sides here, it's the sensory areas for hearing and smell. Now, this little funky looking map down there is called the sensory homunculus, also called the little man. And basically what it is, is a map of how much area of the brain is devoted to sensory information. So if you look at it, you can see way at the back of this map, there's a tiny little area devoted to the genitals. So not a lot of the brain is actually devoted to sensation in the genitals. Whereas if you look towards the front, you have the face and the lips are super big. That's because there's a lot of area that is dedicated to the sensations in our lips and our mouth and our face and our hands, of course. That's another big one. So this is showing you the postcentral gyrus. So how much area of the brain is dedicated to those particular sensations? The primary motor area is that precentral gyrus we were talking about. So this is the motor homunculus right here. Again, look at how much area is dedicated to our mouth and our face and our hands versus, let's say, our toes. So yes, we have motor function in our toes. Yes, it can move. But the majority of our brain area is dedicated to our hand movements and our facial movements. And then again, talking about broken speech area, it's normally in the left frontal lobe, but it contracts, it coordinates contractions of our speech and breathing muscles to help regulate airflow through the vocal cords. So it's the reason why we can speak, as I said. Now this is just showing you all of the association areas and summarizing what they do. So make sure that you go through that. Subcortically speaking, the subcortical nuclei is a mass of gray matter between the cortex and the thalamus. The basal forebrain is important in learning and memory. The hippocampus and amygdala is really important in emotional responses and long-term memory formation. The amygdala specifically, it is thought to house our rage and aggression. And they're actually doing experiments with convicts trying to determine if there is an abnormality or some sort of anomaly in their amygdalas to see if maybe they're bigger than the average person or something to see if they can find a connection between the amygdala and violent crimes versus nonviolent crimes versus no crime. And then the basal nuclei is where cognitive processing happens. It also helps control muscular movements. The limbic system is an aggregation of nuclei. So it is a functional system as opposed to a system itself. It's involved in motions, memory, pleasure, and pain. And as I said, the amygdala with rage and aggression. 
So together, all of these parts are going to function in memory and especially emotional memory. So like if, for example, you smell apple pie and your mom used to make apple pie. So then you start associating it with all of the emotions you have about your mom and making apple pie. And maybe it brings you back to your childhood kind of thing. So that's all the limbic system. Is brain lateralization a thing? Well, the brain is not symmetrical anatomically or functionally. The left hemisphere is really important for controlling your right side, of course, but also with spoken and written language and numeric and scientific skills. So you might have heard people saying we're left-brained or right-brained, meaning you're dominated by science kind of stuff or you're dominated by creative kind of stuff. The bottom line is nobody is specifically right-brained or left-brained, but you may have inclinations towards one or the other. So the right hemisphere, again, that creativity, musical, artistic awareness, space and pattern perception, imagination. So if I had to say if I was one or the other, I would definitely say that I am left-brained. I am more sciencey than I am creative. And my space perception, you know, I'm the kind of person that is like, yeah, that couch will fit through that door, and then it's not even close. So, you know. The diencephalon is located near the midline of the brain, right above the midbrain. It is the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The epithalamus is also called the pineal gland. So it surrounds the third ventricle and acts as a relay station. So that is really, really important to remember. The thalamus specifically acts as a relay station. So all incoming messages, sensory speaking, except for smell, go through the thalamus. And then the thalamus will send it where it needs to go. It also helps regulate body rhythms. The pineal gland specifically helps regulate our circadian rhythm, so our sleep and wake cycles. And then emotions and the hypothalamus is in charge of secreting hormones. So as I said, the pineal gland is in charge of our sleep-wake cycles. It secretes melatonin. Now, melatonin is what makes us sleepy. It is secreted mostly at night. But the pineal gland actually takes cues from the environment. So when it is dark outside, the pineal gland catches that it's dark outside and will start to secrete melatonin to cause sleepiness. Now, this is a problem in people who are blind because they don't have those environmental clues. They can't tell when it's daylight or darkness. So a lot of blind individuals have a lot of problems with sleeping. They're doing some experiments now with children who are blind, trying to help regulate their sleep and wake cycles by giving them injections of melatonin to see if that helps. The thalamus is the relay station. So all sensory impulses, like I said before, except for smell, go to the thalamus, and then the thalamus will send it where it needs to go. It also registers conscious recognition of pain, and then light touch and pressure, and temperature. The hypothalamus, hypo means below, so it's below the thalamus. It regulates many body functions, and notice many is in all caps. It's the kind of thing that if you don't know the answer to a question and hypothalamus is a choice, it's a safe bet to pick hypothalamus because it regulates so many things, especially ones involved in homeostasis. So it's going to control and integrate the autonomic nervous system. It basically serves as a connection between the nervous and the endocrine systems which, as we know, are the two main fun systems that regulate our body functions. It's going to detect changes in body, and then it will release regulating factors known as hormones. And then those hormones are then going to either stimulate or inhibit specific cells in the anterior pituitary gland, which we'll talk about when we talk about hormones, to then release other hormones. 
It's also involved in rage, aggression, pleasure, pain, body temperature regulation, feeling hungry, feeling full, thirst mechanism, sleep and waking states. So there's just a ton of stuff that the hypothalamus does. The brainstem is right on top and continuous with the spinal cord. It's made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain has autonomic functions. It's separated into the tectum and the tegmentum, which is basically the roof and the floor. The tectum regulates auditory and visual reflexes. So there are four rounded elevations in the tectum, and they are the superior and inferior colliculi. And I just love saying colliculi. So the superior colliculi are the reflexes for the head, eye, and neck movements. So these process visual stimuli. The inferior colliculi are auditory stimuli. So if you're watching a scary movie, let's say, and all of a sudden a person jumps onto the screen, well, that's a visual stimulus and your superior colliculi are going to make you jump. On the other hand, if you're watching that same scary movie and you just hear a loud, that's auditory. Inferior colliculi are going to make you jump. The tegmentum, on the other hand, contains nuclei that receive and send information through the cranial nerves, which we'll talk about those in a minute. The pons is right on top of the medulla, and it bridges the spinal cord with the brain and other regions. So it kind of fills the gap. It relays nerve impulses to voluntary skeletal movements from the cerebral cortex to the cerebellum with the pontine nuclei. And the pontine respiratory group contains pneumotaxic and apneustic areas, which are going to help regulate and shut off some involuntary movements. It also gives rise to four pairs of cranial nerves. The trigeminal nerves, which is five, abducens, which is six, facial, which is seven, and vestibulocochlear, which is eight. And we'll talk about all those in a little bit. The medulla oblongata is white matter, and it's the lowest part of the brainstem. Now, this is continuous with the spinal cord, and these are where all of our survival centers are. So that's why if somebody takes a hit to the back of the head, they get very worried because you could stop breathing from it. There are both motor and sensory tracts. So motor are descending tracts, sensory are ascending tracts. And on the interior side, there's two bulges called pyramids. Now they have really large motor tracts from the cerebrum to the spinal cord. And most of the axons actually cross over here. That's called decusation. So the decusation of the pyramids is where the crossing over occurs. So this, is, this contributes to the fact that the left side of the brain controls the right half of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left half of the body. On the posterior side, there's two pairs of prominent nuclei. They contain the bodies of sensory tracts, the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuteatus. Crossing over happens here too. And then kind of scattered all over inside our reflex centers. The cardiovascular center, which is heart rate and vasoconstriction, constriction. The medullary rhythmicity center, which is our respiratory rate. And then some non-vital reflexes like coughing, sneezing, hiccuping, vomiting, swallowing, these are all here. So like I said, that's why if you get a hit to the back of the head, they get really concerned about what's going to happen. There's also the origin for five pairs of cranial nerves, eight, which is the vestibular cochlear, nine, which is glossopharyngeal, 10, which is the vagus, 11, accessory, and 12, hypoglossal. And like I said, we'll talk about all those in a minute. So the reticular formation is kind of like the limbic system with respect to the fact that it's not one thing. It's more of a collection of cell bodies. It's in the brain, the spinal cord, and the diencephalon. There's both sensory and motor functions, and it helps regulate muscle tone. But very importantly, it has the reticular activating system, or RAS. Now, this helps us stay awake and maintain consciousness. So the reason that you can listen to me now and stay awake is because of your reticular activating system. If it becomes inactivated, you 
are sleeping. Now, this is partial consciousness where you can be woken up. If it becomes damaged, then it's a coma. So that's a state of unconsciousness where you cannot be woken up. So inactivation, sleep, damage, coma. The cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain. It's also called the little brain because it looks a lot like it. It's covered in gyri and sulci. It's responsible for comparing information from the cerebrum with the sensory feedback from the peripheral nervous system. And it helps control subconscious skeletal movements. So muscle tone, posture, balance. And it also receives sensory impulses from proprioceptors, visual receptors, and it's going to make any adjustments that are necessary in muscle contractions. Now, those proprioceptors are very important because, remember, a proprioceptor tells you where you're at in space. Now, it's very important for your brain to know where your body is located in space. It's important for your brain to know if you're sitting up versus laying down versus walking around. It's also involved in equilibrium or your balance. So the brain has a privileged blood supply. The contents of the blood can't just go through the central nervous system and get to the brain. We have a blood-brain barrier, which is a very specialized structure that makes sure that our brain stays protected. Our brain has to stay protected. We do not want things to just be able to go into the brain. That poses a problem, though, as well. Because if something happens to the brain, we need to be able to treat it. And it's just not like a medication can go right through the blood-brain barrier like it could get to our heart or something. So the brain is highly protected because the brain is so important to our functioning. So even though the brain is only about 2% of our body weight, it is 20% of the total oxygen. So that means it's doing a lot, metabolically speaking. So it takes a very large portion of the oxygen that we have in our body, considering that it's very small in size relative to everything else in our body. So the blood flows to the brain through the common carotid arteries, and then those branch into the internal carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries, which will merge into the basilar arteries. The circle of Willis is very important. A lot of damage, aneurysms, and other issues happen in the circle of Willis. It's composed of the right and left carotid arteries, and then the branches of the basilar artery, and it basically creates this area of arteries that can maintain perfusion of the brain, even if there's a narrowing or a blockage through one of the parts. So there's just so many branches going around this little area that even if one of them gets kind of blocked off a little bit, the blood will still go to the brain. The blood returns to the circulation through the dural sinuses and then drains into the internal jugular veins to go back to the heart. Now remember, the arteries are going to carry oxygenated blood to the brain and then the veins will carry deoxygenated blood back to the heart. Interruption of oxygen or carbohydrate supply to the brain can cause dizziness, convulsions, unconsciousness possibly, mental confusion. Lysosomes can actually release enzymes that destroy neurons and neuroglia. And if that happens, it can cause permanent damage to the brain cells. So our brain needs a large supply of oxygen and a large supply of carbohydrates to keep functioning. It can only survive minutes without those. So any kind of interruption is going to impact the brain. Now there are three protective coverings, just like with the spinal cord. There's a dura mater on the outside, an arachnoid mater on the middle, and a pia mater on the inside. The pia mater is attached to the brain and it's very thin and delicate. Then the arachnoid mater is kind of spidery looking because of all the innervation it has. And then the dura mater is outside, and it's actually a pretty tough, leathery kind of coating. The dura mater has two layers, an external parosteal layer and an internal meningeal layer. There are also extensions from the dura mater that kind of form really hard membranes that divide the intracranial vault. 
the three are the fall cerebri, fall cerebelli, and tentorium cerebelli. Make sure you kind of look at those just to have an idea of what we're talking about. The CSF is both protective in nature, but also nourishing. It continuously circulates through the subarachnoid space around the brain and spinal cord, and then through the ventricles. There are two lateral ventricles inside the cerebrum, which kind of look like a C. Then there's a third ventricle, which is very narrow, and it's above the hypothalamus. And then a fourth ventricle is between the brainstem and the cerebellum. And cerebral spinal fluid will constantly circulate through these ventricles and around the brain and spinal cord. The choroid plexus is a capillary network in the ventricles. They are covered with ependymal cells and joined together by tight junctions. So remember, tight junctions prevent leakage. The CSF is going to be formed by filtration of blood plasma through these cells. And then the blood-brain barrier is only going to allow certain substances into the cerebral spinal fluid. It's going to make sure that anything harmful stays out. And there's the picture. You can look at the ventricles, those lateral ventricles in the middle there, those C-shaped kind of things. So all the ventricles are going to be lined with these ependymal cells, which will create cerebral spinal fluid. So the cerebral spinal fluid circulates through the ventricles, through the interventricular foramina, through the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle and the subarachnoid. It leaves the fourth ventricle by one median and two lateral apertures. The median aperture leads the cerebral spinal fluid back into the central canal of the spinal cord. And then the CFS is gonna get reabsorbed into the arachnoid villi, which will extend into the blood sinuses. It gets reabsorbed at about the same rate as the choroid plexus is producing. So you have production and reabsorption equaling out. If that gets off somehow, that's when you have pressure problems. CSF is clear and colorless. It contains water, glucose, urea, ions, proteins, a couple white blood cells. The total volume is 80 to 150 milliliters, and about 480 milliliters are absorbed and produced on a daily basis. This is just showing you the flow. So failure of CSF to form and drain normally can result in a buildup of pressure called hydrocephalus. It occurs if you have congenital abnormalities, but it can also occur from a head injury or possibly meningitis. And if you have episodes of bleeding into the brain, that's going to create extra pressure as well. Okay, cranial nerves. There are 12 of them, and you guys got to know the one nerves and their functions. There are a lot of mnemonics out there, and I posted a few in the links for you to remember them. This one is particular, on old Olympus's towering tops, a friendly king viking grew vines and hops. Pick one that you like and use that to remember it. I've also posted some musical ones to hopefully help you out. So spinal versus cranial nerves. The spinal nerves, there's 31 pairs. Cranial, there's 12. Spinal nerves originate from the spinal cord, the cranial from the brain. Spinal nerves are all mixed. Cranial nerves, most of them are mixed, but some are only sensory. The spinal, the target are the limbs and the trunk. The cranial are all in the head and neck, except for the vagus. The vagus nerve actually extends below the head and neck. So cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. Functions in smell and it hits the nasal mucosa. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. It hits the eye and of course is responsible with vision. Three is the oculomotor. That is the midbrain to the eye muscles. So it functions in movement of the eyelid, eyeball, accommodation of the lens and pupillary constriction. Four is the trochlear nerve, midbrain to the eyeball muscles, and it moves the, moves the eye. Six is the abducens, the pons to the eyeball muscles, and it moves the eyeball laterally. Going back to five, the reason that those were grouped together is because they were all with eye movement. Five is the trigeminal nerve. 
The sensory portion has the ophthalmic branch, the maxillary branch, and the mandibular branch. It's sensory functions and cutaneous sensations, so temperature, touch, pain. The motor portion is in chewing, so the mandibular branch. Seven is the facial nerve. Sensory, it is taste buds, so the anterior two-thirds of the tongue goes to the pons. And then we have proprioceptors of the face and scalp to the pons. Sensory function, of course, is taste. Motor, facial expression, secretion of tears, and salivation. So your facial nerve is actually going to control your face your expressions. If that becomes paralyzed, it's called Bell's palsy. This can actually lead to a loss of the ability to close your eyes and impairment of taste and salivation. Sometimes it will happen on one side of the face or the other. My dad, before he passed away, suffered from Bell's palsy. And it was really weird because he would be talking and then all of a sudden, just the left side of his face would go completely paralyzed and he'd still be moving this side, but this side would just be still. It was kind of weird. But Bell's palsy is one of those things that comes and goes, or it can come and go. Eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. The cochlear branch is functioning in hearing. The vestibular branch functions in equilibrium. The glossopharyngeal is cranial nerve 9. Sensory function, the posterior one-third of the tongue. Taste and regulation of blood pressure. And then motor function in swallowing and speech and also secretion of saliva. The vagus nerve is 10. As I said earlier, this is the only one that extends beyond the head and neck. Sensory is taste and somatic sensations from the pharynx and epiglottis. Motorly speaking, swallowing, coughing, voice production, the contraction of the GI tract, secretion of digestive glands. 11 is the accessory. The cranial portion is involved in swallowing. The spinal portion is involved in head movements. The hypoglossal is 12. This is involved in speech and swallowing. And here's a link over here that you can have a cranial nerve review as well. So head injuries can cause injury to the brain. If you have a concussion, this is usually from blunt force trauma. You get hit on the head kind of thing. Um, usually the effects are temporary. A contusion is if you have a blood vessels broken somewhere on your head. So it's kind of like a bruise. And then laceration is an actual cut. CVA or cerebrovascular accident, what we would call a stroke. It's caused if the blood circulation to the brain is blocked somewhere, and then that brain tissue dies. You have an ischemic stroke, which is lack of oxygen, a transient ischemic attack, which is a temporary loss of oxygen, or a hemorrhagic stroke, which is more from pressure buildup, blood loss kind of thing. And tissue plasminogen activating factor is the only approved treatment for TIA currently going on. Neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Critzfield Jacob, MS, these are all disorders where your nervous system starts to degenerate. The myelination will usually start to disappear and you will start to lose your neurocognitive functions, basically. And then there's also developmental disorders like autism and ADHD. These are disorders where you have a lot of problems with social cues, um, ADHD in particular, you can't focus, you have trouble paying attention, as the name implies, you have a lot more energy, so you're kind of hyperactive than other children would be. So make sure you familiarize yourself with these disorders. Some of them we've discussed, some not so much, but make sure you're familiarized yourself with them. And if you have any questions, just send me a message. We will talk for the next chapter. Bye.